So in this lecture, we're going to cover um, the last topic that we wanted to cover in our introduction to finite element analysis. Uh, we're going to cover uh, how to model buckling um, and collapse analysis in uh, 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 in Amex. So we're going to talk about something called the arc length method. The arc length method is a method that can be used when um, uh, to tr or actually to trace a, a descending force displacement curve um, if the forces applied in the, on the structure can be, um, um, can be described by one parameter. In this case, we can apply a reference load on the structure, so we can call it F external, knowing uh, that this load applied on the structure is uh, that the structure is not necessarily going to achieve this load and that uh, this is just a reference load um, and um, the the load can increase or decrease with respect uh, to this applied external load uh, now then we assume that the actual load on the structure is an unknown uh, the actual load on the structure we're going to call it uh, lambda multiply by f external. So if f external is a number, lambda is an unknown uh, parameter. Uh, so basically we introduced an extra value, a variable, and that variable is called lambda, uh, which uh, in the arc length method, it's called a load pro proportionality factor. So we're starting from this point uh, we know that the structure is in equilibrium at this point under displacement u naught uh, and uh, an external force f naught that's equal to lambda naught multiplied by f external. When we'd like to find another point on the force displacement curve. Um, now the displacement is an unknown, and we said we added uh, an extra unknown lambda. When we added the extra unknown lambda, we need an extra equation, and this equation is called the arc length equation. The arc length equation um, basically is um, the equation of an arc centered at the point, the previous point of equilibrium, with a radius r. r is usually given, specified by the user or by the software that's implementing the method. Um, and the, uh, this constraint equation and extra constraint equation uh, um, is added to the equilibrium equations as an extra equation to find the unknown lambda. Uh, what you see here is an equation for this arc. The equation for this arc, uh, basically uh, the uh, lambda minus lambda naught plus uh, u1 minus u naught uh, squared squared under the square root is equal to r. Uh, because of the difference in the scale, because uh, this could be, uh, uh, um, this, uh, to, to make sure that both contribute equally in this equation, uh, these two uh, fractions are normalized um, by uh, uh, particular values, just to make sure that the contribution from this term and the contribution from this term are um, uh, are um, uh, uh, both uh, not necessarily equal, but the the contribution um, 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 uh, they're not too um, they, they both they basically both have to have this uh, need to have the same scale. So when would I need something like this? So as I mentioned in the previous uh, in, in, in the previous lectures, uh, whenever possible, use displacement control. If you have a descending uh, load um, or a de descending load displacement curve, if you can apply displacement on the structure, then apply displacement on the structure. And when you apply displacement on the structure, you are able to trace the you can the the software calculates the reaction. Um, and you're able to draw the force displacement curve um, in the ascending branch and the descending branch. But this is not always possible. For example, if I have a pressure on a surface, um, I, don't, I don't know where that surface is going, how it's going to deform. 
All I know is the value of the pressure. So I cannot really apply a displacement. I don't know what displacement to apply. Um, and it, it, if I'm applying pressure on the surface, it doesn't mean that the displacement of all of the points on the surface is going to be similar. Um, unless I can guarantee that the displacement on the surface is going to be uh, the same, I will have to apply load control by applying the pressure rather than displacement control. So that's if I have pressure on surfaces. Or let's say I have a follower load. If I have a load um, that follows the rotation of the surface and I don't really know how the surface rotates, I cannot really apply a displacement because I don't know um, I don't know the direction of the rotation of the surface. I will have to apply a pressure or a force that follows the rotation uh, um, of the node or the rotation of the surface. Another example, if I have loads that are proportional to each other. So let's look at this cantilever beam. If I have a load, let's say I have a, a concentrated force here and I have a bending moment here. And let's say in this example, there's a, um, uh, um, whether actually whether there is a, a, a descending or ascending or descending uh, load displacement curve, it, that's, uh, it doesn't really matter. I still cannot apply displacement control because here I have a relationship between the applied uh, normal force and the moment. Let's say the force, is, the moment is equal to a force multiplied by a number, uh, 5F or 2F, it doesn't really matter what that number is. Uh, I know a relationship between the forces, but I don't know the relationship between the different degrees of freedom. I know that there's going to be a horizontal degree of freedom, and I know there's going to be a rotation. I don't know the, the relationship between them, so I cannot really apply displacement control. I, I, I can apply force control, I can apply force and 5F uh, and, and 5F or whatever value. So I can apply the force control, but I can not able to apply displacement control. So in many situations, as I'm in, uh, saying here, um, I can apply, I cannot apply displacement control, I will have to apply uh, force uh, control. So, so I have to apply, um, if I'm tracing a, a load displacement, uh, a descending load displacement curve, I will have to use the arc length method. So first, uh, let's look at the arc length method in an uh, in a, just an example. So I have a descending uh, uh, curve of a uh, function f of x, function of x, and I'd like to trace this curve, of course, assuming that I don't really have uh, um, so I, I have this equation, but um, I, I'm starting with the point x0 equals 7 and f0 is equal to 59.22. So I know when I've already found this point. And I'd like to use this point to uh, trace the curve. Now, just to explain, in the Newton Aston method, if I just want to find this value here, I would find um, F, let's say 80, and I would say 80 is equal to negative 0.06x cubed plus 1.2x squared plus 3x. Nonlinear equation, use the Newton Aston method, find x. This is the traditional Newton Aston method. Uh, if I want to adopt the uh, um, the arc length method, I will have to first apply a reference load. The reference load is, doesn't really matter, it could be anything. Here we're saying apply 120. So we have a reference load of 120. And then we say that the load applied on the structure is actually lambda multiplied by 120 equal to this. Now here you've got two unknowns, lambda and x. And so this is only one equation. I need another equation to find lambda and x. So the other equation would be the length of this arc. As we will see in the next lecture. Uh, sorry, in the next All right, so in the first equation, we have uh, the first equation here, f of y minus lambda f external equals zero uh, and so y is the solution that we're trying to find f1 of y uh, and lambda is equal to f of y minus lambda f external and so this equation is basically this equation 
negative 0.06y cubed plus 1.2y squared plus 3y minus 120 lambda equals 0. So this is the um, the equation, and this is the external the, the 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 value that I'm trying to solve this equation at. And instead of applying a particular value for the, uh, I'm applying a, a reference uh, value 120 multiplied by a proportionality factor lambda. So these two uh, y and lambda are unknown. Now I'm putting another constraint on lambda, which I'm making the arc. From the previous point to the next point the length of that arc is equal to 0 0.1 and i'm using these two numbers to make the contribution of both these terms uh, um, they, they contribute some somewhat equally to this equation um, so the first uh, equation the, the first term is lambda the unknown minus the previous uh, value for lambda the previous land uh, uh, value for lambda was 0 0.4935 um, which is the value at which uh, uh, the value of the load proportionality factor um, in the previous uh, at the previous point where I know the solution at, uh, at x not equal 0 lambda not was equal to the force the, or the f 59.22 uh, divided 122 so this is the 0 0.4935 uh, squared plus the difference uh, between y that I'm trying to find and the previous solution which was 7 squared so as you can see here these are two uh, equations in two unknowns the unknowns are lambda and, and y I can solve using the newton nelson method with initial guesses of course the initial guesses make a big difference here we need to put initial guesses that are very close to uh, uh, that allow us to trace the curve and so we can simply use uh, initial guesses as simply the previous points uh, the previous uh, values for the solution so we can use initial guesses for lambda naught as 0 0.4935 and for sorry for lambda we can use this as initial guess and for uh, y we can use 7 as initial guess or somewhere close to those numbers uh, here is um, some mathematical code that you can use to uh, trace the uh, um, the, the curve that we just uh, introduced and in here the um, you can find uh, um, we're using uh, uh, um, um, an arc length that's equal to 0 0.1 so you can study the code and see how it applies to this example all right so in the first increment we used y naught and f naught and when we saw the equations that we you just saw uh, we'll get y equal to 7.967 and f which is equal to uh, lambda multiplied by f external that's equal to 69.72 and lambda in this case is equal to uh, this ratio now we can use this these values here to find a new point on the curve and so on and so starting from an initial point uh, where x naught is given to 7 by 7 and the force the external or the, the 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 value of the function is given by around 59 uh, or around 60 and a lambda is giving uh, is given a lambda naught was given as around 59 over 120 from this point we were able to trace the curve uh, by drawing an arc of a length 0.1 uh, and uh, finding a point on the curve and then from this point again we drew another arc and found another point and so on and we're able to trace all the way up to the peak and beyond because as we mentioned both the load or or the 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 the, the, the value of the force or the value of the uh, the value of the uh, uh, function f of x and the value of x both are unknown the initial guesses are very important in this method it is possible that the uh, beyond the peak um, the uh, the next point would be found on the descending curve uh, but then if you try to find the next point if the initial guesses are not assumed properly you uh, could find that from this point uh, 
because uh, we're really drawing a car, uh, an arc and trying to find the next point on the curve, this you can think of uh, the arc as a whole circle. And so it is possible that from this point, rather than moving forward, you could move back. Uh, so whether you find this point or this point de depends on the initial guesses in the neutron nelson method. Um, and so um, in the code online, uh, you can play around with initial guesses and you can find that if you uh, don't put the correct initial guesses, you might uh, be going in a, an in a perpetual or infinite loop where this point predicts this point and then this point predicts this point and so on. Only by uh, providing a proper initial guesses, you will be able to trace the curve uh, properly. Uh, for the assignment, we're asking you to solve this particular problem. You have uh, two displacements, um, or it, you have two links. Uh, both uh, are uh, they are connected. Um, uh, they're both uh, link members or trust members, so the the the, the rotation, the relative rotation is allowed uh, under a force p, and there's or uh, this point undergoes a horizontal and vertical displacement. Now let's see uh, uh, what or let's see what happens as the load increases. So as the load increases, uh, these two links move down. So there's a, an a, an increase in p as the displacement increases. Now there is a certain point right here where the two links are horizontal. At this point, there's really no uh, uh, resistance to uh, to the applied load. So in, in fact, at this instant, the load is expected to be zero, which means that the load is in, uh, increases up to a certain point and has to decrease again to reach zero at this point. When this starts moving down, then this load uh, will change its sign to be uh, acting upwards. So basically, uh, we expect the relationship between P um, uh, and U2 to look like this, and between P and U1 to look like this. Um, as uh, you can see, as P increases, um, as U2 increases, P, in P increases, and at some point it starts increasing again and will reach zero, and then it will reverse sign. The equations that need to be solved as are as follows. Um, this vertical distance uh, after, if you assume uh, u1 and u2, this vertical distance is 1 minus u2, this horizontal distance is 5 minus u1, and this is 10 plus u1, this angle is theta1, and this angle is theta2. Uh, if we assume uh, force p1 and p2 in these two uh, uh, links, and this is link 1 and this is link 2. The length of link 1 is given by this equation. The length of link, uh, the length of link 2 is given by this equation. I can calculate epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. I can calculate the force in the link first link and the force in the second link. I can calculate cosine theta 1, cosine theta 2, and sine theta 1, sine theta 2 from, uh, the, um, from these uh, triangles. And I can uh, write the equations of motion or the equations of equilibrium because right at this point, some of the forces in the vertical direction is zero and some of the horizontal uh, forces equal to zero. Uh, I will write a third equation because I don't know, uh, I'm trying to trace the load displacement curve, so I don't really know what value of the load I should apply. So I'm going to put a reference value of P max and add another unknown as lambda, where P max is a, uh, a particular value, uh, a given value, but the actual applied load in the structure is a, a, a number multiplied by this load. Now, to find this lambda, I need to add an extra equation, a constraint equation that constrains the relationship between the load and the displacement. And I've given you the equation here. Um, lambda minus an initial lambda, u1 minus an initial displacement, u2 minus initial displacement, all squared under the square root is equal to 0 0.05. Uh, solving these three equations, you can trace the, uh, the, the curve of p versus u1 and p versus u2. All right, so uh, now we're going to talk about implementing this in the software Alex. 
So in the last lecture, we solved uh, a beam, uh, sorry, a, a shell. Um, we looked at a pipe and we applied a rotation and we compared the uh, pressurized uh, uh, moment, uh, the response of moment versus rotation in the pressurized pipe versus mo moment versus rotation in the depressurized pipe. So in this lecture, I'm going to just show you how you would implement this uh, using a force control rather than displacement control. In the previous lecture, we showed you how to do it using uh, displacement control where we applied rotation here. In this lecture, we're going to show you what you need to change simply to make it a uh, force control rather than displacement control. Uh, so if uh, you, I would uh, advise you to revise the previous lecture, uh, uh, the lecture notes where we showed you uh, how to use shell elements to produce uh, this model. So uh, we already talked about this in the previous lecture, pipelines when they go through uh, soil, uh, uh, pipelines are buried in soil when they uh, sometimes go through, um, are susceptible to um, or exposed to uh, ground movements. Uh, when the ground moves, uh, they, they apply a, a, a basically a displacement on the pipe that w might lead to uh, buckling or wrinkling. So, so uh, this, um, what you see here is, for example, is a ripple um, due to an axial load due to ground movement or uh, some ripples on one side due to a bending uh, of a pipe. So whether you apply, whether it's under axial force or under bending moment, uh, what happens is that there is a peak and uh, beyond the peak, uh, of course, the pipe still can carry whatever is inside of it. Um, it just, it no longer can carry, uh, it, it's no longer as stiff as it used to be because of the, uh, because of the presence of the buckles and the wrinkles. Now to capture this descending uh, load displacement curve, there's two, uh, ways you can do a displacement control like we did last time or we can do the Rix algorithm or the arc length method and in abacus it's called the Rix algorithm which is the arc length method uh, just a note because uh, as the pipe deforms you will get a, a ripple or a buckle on one side. You can see that the, 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 the strains right at this point will, will vary, uh, will be um, uh, varying between the compression at some point, tension at some point, but uh, the industry um, measures uh, a com or defines some, something called the compressive strain capacity, which is the average compressive strain at a particular uh, gauge length, basically sort of uh, delta overall or delta average divided by L at which uh, the buckle uh, starts forming or at which or, or basically the compressive strain that corresponds to the peak of the, the applied load. The gauge length depending on uh, usually uh, the, the the study usually it's taken as uh, one of the uh, uh, is equal to the outside diameter or twice the outside diameter. So this is the same example that we uh, uh, presented in the previous lecture. Um, we are using uh, uh, we used displacement control previously. Shell elements calculated the compressive strain capacity. We actually uh, drew the um, the moment rotation curve for both uh, pressurized and unpressurized pipe. Uh, this is the given the material and the geometry of the pipe. Uh, this is what we did last time, uh, uh, but we only did the moment versus rotation. So we uh, basically first applied pressure, then applied rotation in a second step, and then plotted the moment versus rotation. Uh, we could also uh, uh, look under axial load. So under axial load, we pressurized, then we applied displacement, and we plot force versus displacement. 
uh, these are some hints if you are planning on calculating the compressive uh, the the uh, compressive capacity this is not something that we're asking you to do but this is just a hint for those who might uh, be uh, 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 doing this for their project for example in order to calculate the compressive strain capacity so you can uh, you can define an element set and choose those the element set um, and then export uh, uh, the average compressive strain um, uh, and calculate the average compressive strain for the whole set so that you uh, can calculate the comp uh, some sort of comp uh, uh, the, uh, the compressive strain capacity and you can do the, this create uh, sets by uh, creating partitions in your part so once you create your part and we created those parts previously you can create uh, uh, different um, you can create different um, partitions by defining uh, planes and, and and using those planes to create partitions and then creating different uh, sets uh, based on the geometry so for example right here we chose uh, the the moment or the rotation is going to be applied here and we're already utilizing symmetry so this is the pipe the moment is applied here we're utilizing symmetry so we're only molding the quarter of the pipe uh, molding the quarter of the pipe we can use uh, we can apply some imperfections on a small section here uh, we can apply some imperfections to make sure that the buckle appears in this section we can also uh, choose a small area here where the compressive strain the average strain can be uh, the, the strain can be averaged and we can then calculate some sort of an average compressive strain capacity at the maximum corresponding to the maximum load so uh, just like uh, last time we're going to use symmetry and we're going to uh, apply uh, the loads on uh, or the rotation on the reference point we're going to use the rix or the arc length method so we're going to apply either axial force or a moment of course on the um, on the reference point um, and the software will calculate something called the load proportionality factor we need just to define some sort of a, a reference force or a reference moment and the uh, software will then uh, proceed to calculate a, a, a percentage of that load So we're going to repeat what we did last time, but using the Rix method. So for the Rix method, the only difference is um, um, after the pressurization step, you create, uh, instead of static general, you create a static Rix method. And then you apply a load. So this is under... Uh, when we apply, uh, if we want to check the compressive strain capacity under axial load, so we apply a concentrated force on the reference point, and here's the uh, uh, reference load that is applied. Or if we want to apply a moment, Here's the value of the reference a moment that we, uh, you apply, and uh, this is CM1 because the the when the, the geometry was drawn, this uh, was axis one. So this bending moment is around axis one. If your load uh, displacement uh, curve uh, using the Ricks method is a bit finicky. So you have to run it, and sometimes it reaches the maximum load, and then it, the, the, sometimes it's not able to trace the descending part of the load displacement curve. So if it does not, if you're not able to trace the load displacement curve in the descending portion, you need to change the imperfections, uh, maybe change the mesh, until the uh, Rick's method predicts decrease in the load proportionality factor. The In the results section, if you look at the status file, uh, the uh, increment of time or load proportionality factor tells you uh, what is uh, um, what is happening in terms of the external load so in the first step 
which is the pressurization. It's, it was fully applied, there was no issues. When in the second step, you can see um, these, uh, um, the, 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 this one uh, did not converge. These converged, the low proportionality factor was 0 0.2, 0 0.16, 0 0.04, 0 0.019. So these are the uh, percentage of the applied external load. And then it started decreasing. These negative values indicate that there is a dis we're now going through the descending part of the load displacement curve. And so this is, uh, once you see the negative, you, it, it implies that you, the load displacement curve is decreasing. It is here happens to increase again, but then it decreases again. And uh, this is the result for the case under axial load. The load versus displacement will look like this. So we saw that there was an, an, an increase and then a decrease and then an increase and then a decrease and so on. So the uh, Rex method was able to capture this uh, uh, this uh, oscillating behavior in the load displacement curve. Um, we can plot the load versus average compressive strain if we'd like to find the average compressive strain corresponding to the maximum load. Um, all right, so um, uh, there are a few other examples that you can try on, on your own using the Rick's method. Uh, I provided all the information uh, for these examples, the, the, the applied load, uh, the applied moment, and uh, you can use and the stress strain curves and the geometry. So you can try these uh, in Abacus and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, example four was an old example, um, um, but uh, doing uh, through the, we're going through the same, uh, uh, um, the same thing, pipe bending with a, this test strain curves uh, under uh, an applied moment, uh, um, and then again plotting the, the, the moment versus rotation and to see, uh, to capture the descending uh, part of the curve. Uh, the, for the assignment problem, you really uh, are required to repeat the problem that we did in the class last time. Um, 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 use the, the, the uh, elastoplastic materials, you pressurize the pipe and then you uh, apply uh, a, a bending moment and then capture the moment displacement curve and the, the uh, capture the behavior for the pressurized versus the unpressurized pipe. Use symmetry of the problem. Um, here you can use both displacement and Rick's method. I would recommend that you use both displacement control and force control and compare your solutions for both. If you're not able to uh, apply the Rick's uh, method, which is the, 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 the force control, at least you have the displacement control because in, uh, which you can, uh, by which you can capture the, the descending part of the curve.